Right on today's guest, we've got Tom Watson, uh, currently a business development manager, manager at Raywork Gladstone. How you going, brother? Very good, Lucky. Thanks for having me on. No, nah, it's good, man. Um, Known you for some time now. Obviously, our old boys have their long relationship. And I know for a fact that you've always had that bit of a hustle in you from a young age. <laughs> Whereabouts do you think yeah. you got that from? Uh, look, obviously the old boy. Look, he's um, he's just 10 times what I am, I think. It's, it's what you look up to. I can say as much for your boy too, knowing what I know. Um, yeah, he's just, yeah, it's that inspiration, I think, yeah. But I um, yeah, I suppose from when we were a little bit younger, I'd sort of, like that's, that's a big appreciation I had is like when you don't grow up with too much, you sort of learn that appreciation for what parents have built and sort of go make your own. And I just figured that out when I was 15. It's just like no one's going to build it for me, so let's build it myself and sort of just tried a couple of different things and got my experience where I could. And I think that was a big thing for me is just trying everything. So I tried a little bit of the videography when I was younger and then tried, tried to have a couple of jobs on the go all at once. And I, I will say that much. I, I loved the hustle when I was a kid. I think that was a, a, a big, big character development stage for me, I would say. Um, just trying to bite off more than I can chew and chew like all hell. And, uh, yeah, I suppose it's sort of what's brought me to where the person I am now and sort of hopefully what I'm going to be in the future as well, yeah. So you say 15, was it, the age you started? Yeah, I'd say so. So I suppose it's uh, it's when I got my first job, yeah. So would have been 14 when I first got my job and it was started that appreciation for money and well, what $20 really means when you're, when you're making 11 bucks an hour. Um, and then it's sort of just exploring like, okay, well, I don't want to work five hours for 100 bucks. I don't want to work five hours for 50 bucks. So I want to work five hours for 200 bucks. So where can I do that? And you start exploring different avenues. And obviously when you're a kid, you jump online, you <laughs> had to make money quick and yeah, you just sort of start exploring, which was nice. Yeah, I guess we're in that um, that age bracket, I guess, where the internet was kind of like, we were still quite young when the internet was starting to blow up. And he definitely had like a YouTube, Google, even like ChatGPT now, um, where you can just explore all these different um I guess, pathways of a career and something that, you know, our old boys may not have had. It was more so get a trade, go to uni, get a job. Um, so I think that the ability we've been blessed with now has been just so, I guess, so crucial to what we're doing now, like myself and you working in real estate. Um, obviously, real estate's been around for as long as ever. But um, I guess without your your ability to be able to experiment, would you think you would be in a real estate role today? Oh, absolutely not, no. So, I, um, yeah, look, I, I was 16 when I first thought about the real estate thing and um, the preface of it all was I want to be I want to be paid for my efforts, not for my time because um, I, I recognised when I was a little bit younger that like, when I work, I, I'll give it a good good yak and um, if I'm going to give 110% and get paid as much as the guy that gives 70 um, – well, I just didn't see that that was fair. So I started exploring avenues where that's going to be a commission-based role, I started to realise. Um, love my teachers for that back at Miriam Val. Really small school, but they really do care about their kids. Um, and what I found there especially was um, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> I love him. He was my woodwork teacher and he just goes, you would be a great real estate agent, Tom. And it sort of crossed my mind and I didn't think too much about it. I tried a couple of avenues with real estate. Uh, not real estate, sorry, industry. Um was exploring the electrical options and process technicians, everything else with the smelter. Um, then I sort of come back to base and I realised that, yeah, no, I, he's completely right. Go, go explore those avenues. And I think that even if it wasn't real estate, um, which I've obviously developed a real good passion for now, um, it was going to be something sales-based, yeah, which I thought I would thrive in. And I think, um, yeah, hopefully I'm right about it all. <laughs> what abilities did he more so like? target or seeing you that gave him that that belief that you would be a good real estate, real estate agent do you do you think yeah look I think um it was just my my willingness just to learn anything and give it a hundred percent um like when I was in when I was in Miraville I was a great kid always got good grades um and I had a lot of respect for the older people because I sort of understand where they come from like my mum used to work at the school too so I knew these people on a personal level um, it wasn't so much my teacher, it was more of a friend. Um, so I actually really did value their advice and I think that, yeah, the 
the qualities that he saw, saw in me back then is that obviously you can get good grades and you can put in a good good effort, but um, it's that willingness to come back in your lunch break and go after school. And if you've got a woodwork project like where we're building <laughs> like maybe little clocks and stuff, like I was trying to build beds and bedside tables and TV units and stuff. So um, him allowing me to do that and him just seeing that I'm so willing to put in the effort for it all. Um, and then when I became a school captain at, at the school, he saw that I, he called it the gift of the gab, <laughs> talk your ass off. So, um, yeah, I think that's what he saw in me initially and okay, I hope he's right. <laughs> it's working out. Yep. And as you said, you're from Miriam Vale. So mm. for those who maybe listen to this from somewhere else, um, very small town, probably like 500 people, if that. Yeah, about that. So you probably know everyone too, um, yep. getting around the block. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you find that also helped you with probably the one thing I see in you that you're probably the greatest at is your communication skills. Do you think that had a massive impact living in that small community? Absolutely. I, I definitely think so because it's – I feel like there's a little bit more pressure on you to, to get it right. Like when you, and it, it wasn't so much just being in a small town because you know everyone in – like you can have those more personal conversations. You don't, you don't feel anxious or have any anxiety about having to talk to someone that might be a couple levels higher up than you, a principal or business owner or anything like that. Um, because you know, I'm more on a personal level and understanding that like, just because you're having a person chat to this person, it doesn't mean that you have to be anxious about anything. And I realized that when I was 16, it's yeah, you're just having a conversation with your friend essentially. And as long as you go in with that mentality, you, you shouldn't really have, too many issues and you shouldn't really stumble over your words too much because it, it takes the pressure off your shoulders a little, a little bit, I think, as well. Yeah. yeah. And you don't feel when you're growing up that living in a small town that that would have an impact on your success in the future? Because I feel like a lot of people from country towns, Miriam Bales, you wouldn't say so much country, um, but from small towns anyway, um, the idea that I'm from a small town so I have limited access to be able to build a career um, and be successful do you think that at all limited you? Uh, I, I would say it was mentally when I was younger. Um, between those ages of 14 and 16, I thought that a little bit. I was thinking, oh, I'm not going to have the same opportunities as someone in a big city. And, like, you see you, comparisons the thief of joy. Like, you'd see everything online about 16-year-olds doing what they can and mm. you sort of just write it off out of envy that, oh, they had better opportunities than I did. And I'm in a small time town and you make excuses, but... Um, especially around 2019 when I started to graduate, I started to realise that you're only going to be what you make of yourself. So if you're willing to put in the effort, small towns not going to hold you back. Yeah. Yep. We'll go back to where you got your first job. So that was working at the pub. Yeah. Moomba Hotel. Yep. <laughs> Love Mitchy. <laughs> he, um, yeah, best boss ever, honestly. He's, he's just someone that would give anyone a go. Um, young fella, like... Who wants to bring a fourteen-year-old on to to come on load twenty thousand dollars worth of uh, worth of grog in the afternoon, or come cook 50, 60 meals for the uh, for everyone in your restaurant? Like you, you got to have a bit of trust, and he was just always about that. He was just ready to give everyone a crack, no matter who they were. Um, so plenty of respect to him. And I stayed with Mitch for about four years there while working alongside a couple other jobs. But um, yeah, he was just endless support. Yeah, which was a big thing for me because like you don't. I didn't realize that at the time, but you don't, you don't always get that from employers, especially when you're younger, you, you get stomped on a little bit when you make mistakes, but he was always just learn from it. Let's move on. Yeah. So I think that, um, yeah, with the pub, it was a great starting point. And from there, I sort of worked my way over to the, the motel and then doing little bits and pieces of cash jobs. And dad ended up buying me a mower and he's just like, oh, go mow some yards. I used to do that when I was younger. And that was a, that was a big ding for me. So I, I started mowing yards on the side and, um, we got to a period there where I was 15 and I was making eight, 800 bucks to a thousand dollars a week on yards. Um, so I had this little bit of a, a small business going in, in Moonbell, which is crazy to me. And I, I didn't realize how big of a deal it was to be doing that at your age. Um, because I was just, I, I just thought, I just want to suck heaps of money away and everyone's doing it. So I just keep up. Um, so like you work two or three jobs and then you do your mowing every afternoon and, uh, I used to love that schedule. I used to run it. It, it baffles me why I did it as a kid um, because, like, oh, I can say this much. I don't do it anymore. Like, oh, I would say that I work hard but not that hard. Um, 
yeah, it was like you get up at 5.30 and yeah, I, it just felt like one day I snapped my fingers and everything just had to change instantly. Um, so like when I was grade six, I was born by 90 kilos. Yeah, I was big boy. Um, so the big first thing was I want a girlfriend, <laughs> so I've got to lose some weight. Um, and from there I learned a bit of discipline, sort of went, okay, I need to make some money, had some appreciation for what money is. Um, and then I thought, okay, I want to do some, something good academically. So I, I got really stuck into school. Um, and it just felt like, and I always say this, which is strange because it, when I think of it socially, it wasn't that good of a year, but 2019 was the, one of the best years of my life just because of everything I had accomplished in that year. Um, but it was quite literally get up at 5.30, go out, do a run, do an hour gym session, come back, get ready for school, go out to school. And like you get to school a little bit earlier because you've got to do some prep because you've got some meetings, the school captains. And it was all really low profile stuff, but I was always trying to trying to boost up the space and I always want to leave my mark where I'm somewhere. So like for me, I, I was always trying to get some community initiatives going and uh, it was a little bit of the behind the scenes work there with the teachers and then you come into school and you go through to your lunch break and then your lunch break, you do more of the stuff. Um, and your lunch breaks as well, you sort of plan in a few different things financially and doing whatever you can with your, your woodwork and your other subjects. And straight after school, it's like, all right, we've got two more jobs to get done. I start work at eight o'clock. Cool. I'll get those more jobs done, have a quick shower, run up to the pub, which was funny as because I remember people taking videos of me from the pub when they're having a skill of an afternoon. And it's this little young fellow with this weird get up and his hair's all sideways and he's running up the street with the mower and I'm just trying to get everything done. But um, yeah, come eight o'clock and then I work through to 10, 11 and then go home, have a sleep and just hit reset. And it was six, seven days a week doing that when I was 16, which I thought was normal because my dad puts in a hard yucky. He was always doing similar stuff. So I always just set that as my example and um, it paid off. It paid off heaps. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, I was 16 there. And it was, I have an appreciation, which we'll get, get into later, which things can change so drastically. But um, yeah, I was 16, I had 65,000 in the top, top end when I had everything going all at once, just before I bought my car. Um, and like I, like I said, I thought everyone was doing that. I thought everyone had the same sort of, sort of set up. And then when it was only when I really got to Tanham and my senior years that I realized that uh, maybe this is a little bit different. Um, but I think that, yeah, it was just that, that grind and then you can appreciate what your, what your capacity really is. Um, cause you sort of, you can sort of limit yourself. You ever hear that saying where you put a, put a flea in a tub and put a lid on it and then you take the lid off and you can only jump as high as you could with the lid on, um, living your capacity. So like, I, I just realized that capacity is only what you can make it and, and you can work as much as you want. But the big thing for me as well is that I really enjoyed it. It wasn't like I was miserable doing any of it. Um, I love the grind, which was nice because it gave me an appreciation for what I do now and, and enjoying that even though you might not want to do this right now, you know what it's going to result in. And as long as you're enjoying what you're doing to a degree, um, it's not a chore and it's, it's not miserable by any means, I don't think. Yeah, 100%. I love that. I love that little, um, I guess, analogy you can say if you put a flea in a tub. Yeah. You know, it jumps up high when you take it off. I think the one that I've heard that's similar is like if you put a dome over a tree and then you take the dome away and then – the tree goes through a storm. It's hasn't built up the strength from the roots to be able to withstand that. It's just going to all day of the week just fall over. So I really like that. Yeah. And I guess you could say that's probably, probably one of the gifts of living in a small town is you don't see what other kids are doing on the after school, uh, before school weekends. Cause there is probably like, like how many people were in your grade, for example? Oh, look at my grade and sub 20. Yeah. Maybe sub 15. 20. Yeah. That's it. So you, to you that is normal because you're not seeing what other young people are doing and like I said you could probably see that as a gift in a way growing up in that small community yeah yeah exactly right um yeah <laughs> it was a big thing for me because I, I realized that um it actually was a gift because I had subconsciously without even realizing it separated myself from the the bad influences and um the distractions I would say so where you might have had the ability to run down to Macca's and maybe go to the skate park with your friends in an afternoon. Sort of like you come home and you get a choice to play the games or sit on the couch and watch telly. And once I sort of hit 15, 16, I didn't have an interest for the games and it was more so around the fact that I didn't want to have to pay for new ones because <laughs> I was nice and tired and I just wanted to buckle down and save. So I just realised that if I'm not going to do this, I'm just bored. 
let's go fill the time somehow and the hustle was something I enjoyed. So that's what sort of took a replacement. And doing all that physical labor, like you work in the pub, the motel, mowing all the lawns, is that why you started to look into like YouTube more so? Because it was kind of more of a mental game than physically. Um, sorry, it's more, I guess, more of a mental aspect than physical aspect. So something that was mm. for longevity was more worthwhile. And like you said, you get paid on your value, not so much your time. Yeah, exactly right. I suppose um, a big portion of it is like, oh, like I said earlier, I just wanted to realize I don't want to get paid. Fifty bucks for five hours of work. Where where can I get paid more for this? And you just start doing your how to make money online courses and whatever else. Um, but a huge thing for me was I like recognized and I thought that I was a, a smart kid when I was younger because of my grades. I thought that okay, if I'm a smart person, this is something that Ando re- leaned on me heaps when I was younger as well. He goes, use your mind and see your body, mate, because your mind's going to be a way better asset than your body is. Um, anyone can use their hands, whereas if you've got a brain up there and you can use it, you, you'll do 10 times better. Um, so I started to use it and I, I realized, okay, investments, that was, <laughs> I, I love that man. And Mr. Anderson just changed it for me. Yeah. Um, cause he brought a, uh, a banker in as well and he sort of showed me some, some of the investment potentials and what compound interest was. And, um, it really just sort of got my brain ticking. Um, but also with it, I found that, um, yeah, where can you make the most money for the least amount of time contributed? Uh, and it's not so much about working less. It's more so about, okay, if I'm going to spend 10 hours and I can have this opposed to this, it's it's more efficiency and it's just using your brain there. So um, a big part for me was YouTube. Now I tried a bunch of different things with YouTube and you know from experience as well that it's, uh, it's an interesting game to get into and there's so much to learn there with search engine optimization and like – like obviously with how you frame things, your thumbnail is a huge thing, your title, what's in your description, and then the other things that you can leverage there as well, whether or not you're selling apparel and doing affiliate marketing, whatever else. Um, so I explored the YouTube, the e-commerce, affiliate marketing. Um, we went through a little bit of a, a spell there where I was trying to do um, <laughs> like Etsy stores and some stuff on eBay and stuff like that. So, um, and, and like Facebook marketplace flip and stuff. Um, and the one that worked out for me was I decided just to go volume on everything. Um, so I tried like six or seven different e-commerce businesses and a couple of different affiliate marketing programs. And I sort of realized within three to six months what was going to be worth wasting your time on. And the YouTube one was the one that was actually paying. And I realized with the AdSense program, um, really big game changer for me there because I ended up just bulk uploading a whole bunch of videos. And my mentality was, okay, what's trending? Let's just go with that. Just make heaps of videos on, pardon me, uh, what's trending and, and what I sort of have an idea of. And because I used to play video games, I thought, oh, Fortnite, we'll get into that. And I bulk uploaded Fortnite videos <laughs> every night, every day. It was like, that's what I started working on in my lunch breaks is sort of figuring out how thumbnails work. And um, after school, that's where the, the hustle come in, where I wasn't mowing yards. And um, from that YouTube account, I realized that, of her, like I've got videos there where it's a 15 minute video it took me 45 minutes to make total and it's made eight and a half thousand dollars off AdSense just because it's hit two, three million views. Um, and that, that's across a longer time frame. Like it takes a 18 months to get to that sort of caliber, but still within that first six months, you'll, you'll still see half a million views if you, if you got it right. And, um, still even in that instance, it's like a $2,000 paycheck. And when I, when I started seeing that come through on top of the mowing and, and my jobs and everything, I just started to realize, okay, I need to start investing my time elsewhere. Um, having three jobs wasn't a wasn't an appealing option to me because one was like eleven or twelve bucks an hour, fifteen bucks an hour, and best one was seventeen bucks an hour. Um, so I just dropped all three. I uh, hunkered down on what was generating income, which was the the mowing business at the time and and the YouTube, um, and actually got me got me pretty far. And that's that's where a lot of those savings started to compound too, which was good. Um, and then obviously once you got the money there, you sort of go, okay, what do I do with this? Um, cause everyone and your friends think, go buy a big car, I'll go spend it, go, go have some fun. Um, but to me, I was just like, okay, well, I know that everyone else has maybe one to $5,000 at that age. So if I had that and then took the rest of it and put it somewhere where it's going to better me for the future, what, what would that look like? Um, and then I started looking at the compound interest side of things. So I got really into the stocks um started exploring like that whole nft with the, the crypto and everything as well digital coins and um i've been burnt real bad in the past 
with a lot of those investments, but there was a lot of them that paid off well too. Um, my my favorite personally was the um, ETFs and listed investment companies and stuff like that, where it's a diversified stock portfolio, um, and you're sort of just looking at steady growth between seven and eleven uh, percent per year. So where there's little bit of security, but like you're not making three percent interest or two percent interest off the bank account, um, like off a term deposit or something like that. I started to really recognize that okay, I can make my money work for me, um, and then letting it compound as well, and and realizing the power of what superannuation is, and starting to make contributions to that where I could, and off my own back, and and just realizing that okay, now what's the next big thing? Tax. Start looking into that and how that ties in with super and. Yeah, it was just a real big eye opener for me, and like that all started rolling out when I was sixteen, seventeen, and um, it was it, it was good because I had a lot of friends that didn't know that space at all. Um, they were like really confused about everything, and being able to go, okay, well, let's sort of learn it together, and then we can both get across it. That sort of makes it a little bit more enjoyable because, as you know, the the numbers game isn't always so fun. Um, it's not so much hustle either, but yeah. It's a, it, was, it was a big change for me and it's one that I really appreciate that I went through. Yeah. It's definitely that I feel like I fell into that rut where they get rich quick scheme. Yeah. Like I'm going to get rich in whether it's six, 12 months. Um, and there's not even thinking beyond that. It's like I'm going to get the money in 12 months and then there's no game plan from there, or business plan you could say. Yeah. Um, and that's and I learned that and I learned that lesson very well. And um, I guess – it's that it's that embarrassment you get like okay like business is not 12 months it's 10 years yeah. to learn this one skill like master it um and i think do what you have done where you trial and error everything very yeah. quickly rapidly and then find the thing that makes the money and that you enjoy most and have a passion for and then just like buckle down on that and just hustle hustle and the other thing i want to touch on too is you're 22 now uh 20 20. There you go. <laughs> 20, bro. That's the thing. Like you're only 20. Obviously you've been through school, um, done this physical labor and all these hours and learned all these things, crypto, tax. How do you, how do you balance your life with this, with family, friends, or were you not balanced? Were you unbalanced the whole time? Do you think? Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that, uh, if you truly give something 100%, something's got to give. And uh, unfortunately at that sort of age and luckily when you're a teenager, it's sort of what you, your family expects from you. You, you sort of shut them out one way or another. Um, oh, I very much did shut out a lot of people when I was doing the, the hustle. Um, that's something that was a huge thing for me as well as when I was 16, I, I just thought about it so much. And I was just like, there was one point there where I was just like, I would give all this up for a social life. I just want to be a normal kid. Yeah. And um, not having that social life just made me really isolated. And for a long time there, it was just like, I love the hustle. I don't care being alone. I got my brothers, I got my sisters, my family. Like that, that's what's important to me. But um, yeah, that social aspect is a huge part and it, it takes a toll on your mental too. So I think that, yeah, for me, really unbalanced, but I have an appreciation for how to balance things better and, and the fact that just because you're going to give someone 100% doesn't mean you're not going to take every aspect out of your life, out of the rest of your life. So, like, where <laughs> where you might want to work 16 hours out of your your 24 hour day and sleep for eight, you you sort of break it up a little bit and you, you sort of make your compromises. And um, just because you're trying to balance things doesn't mean you have to stop being efficient or stop your workload. Um, a great way that I like to keep on top of that is just incorporating those people into that hustle. Um, so like with my brother Alex, trying to get him involved in the mowing business, trying to get him involved on the YouTube, having some sort of affiliation there where he's giving me ideas, we're working on thumbnails together and just sort of getting him in on it. Um, same with my sister, like she started a, uh, a clothing line there for a, for a good period and something I have a passion for because I love that whole marketing side of things and um, the, the digital advertising and social media and stuff like that. So. Um, her and I got really incorporated on that too. And, um, I think it goes with that same mum and dad are just endless support that whole way through that just anything, even when it got out of hand and like, especially with, with the, uh, dieting and, and the gym and everything, I just, I took it way too far next level. Um, just because I was just trying to reach unachievable goals and despite all of that, they, they gave me their insights and they, they discouraged me on a few things, but endless support still. And 
if it's something I wanted to do and they're just going to let me do it and I'll learn my lessons the way I learn my lessons. And as long as they show that they love me and they cared about it, um, that was all that mattered to me. And that was, that was a big thing for me to realise is that even if you can see that someone's not doing well or might be working towards something that's probably not the best end goal, um, still having support for them throughout that because even if that's not the best thing, they'll come to that realisation on their own and they'll learn that lesson. Um, there's no better lesson to, to teach someone than letting them learn on their own, I think, because um, you always let a, let a horse to water but you can't make them drink. Um, and I was super, super stubborn about that when I was when I was younger. It's, I always thought I knew better because um, everything was just 100 miles an hour in my brain and I, I just was thinking about every, every different angle and um, I thought a lot about um, do I take advice from people that I'm in a position that I, I want to be in and um, – starting to realise that just because someone's not in a position that you want to be in, maybe financially, maybe living situation, however that look, they're very much in a position you want to be emotionally, family-wise, like their, their ethics and their values, like that's the admirable part of that person and being able to pick those little pieces from people um, and, and conversations and influences like we talked about earlier um, was a huge learning curve for me because to me I had just one goal and that was to, to make money quick or to, to get ripped quick or to just achieve all those goals as fast as I can and there was nothing that could stop me on the way and I'll cut every bridge to get there. Um, but getting around that was a big thing for me and th that especially came in when I was a little bit older, when I was more so 18 through to 19. And um, like there was periods there where I, I fully just shut my life out and I, I just disappeared. I went travelling and I just fully moved up and having that appreciation of the fact that holy these people are actually huge pillars in your life and you can't cut them out and if you feel this way about them imagine how they feel about you um was a huge thing for me and I, i'm glad that i learned a lot of that when i was younger yeah i love that you mentioned that because that's one thing for me i was always like growing up here in gladstone i was you know having a love for the beach and the ocean i always want to and the also having a massive um i guess you could say attraction to the city life um, the rush, um, you know, being extremely busy. I was really attracted to that and I always wanted to, I felt like I always just wanted to get away from Gladstone, like this is where I wasn't supposed to be. Um, I'm supposed to be elsewhere in this life. Um, I guess that's partly why the reason why I started entrepreneurship because that was a way that I could, if I had the financials to be able to do that, I could just leave and live wherever I wanted. And as time went on, I started to realise more and more that, everything I needed was right here the whole yeah. time. Uh, the parents I have, the family, and then even the mentors and the the knowledge that's in this town is, um, and I guess in any town really, um, is unbelievable. And I guess, like you said, you've touched on that as well. You got Mr. Anderson, your parents, um, and even who would you say would be your mentors today that you have around you? Huge mentors. I think as that saying, it's my boss, Andrew. Huge inspiration, that man, and every, everything I've learned from him so far and everything he does for everyone is is next level. It's really admirable. Um, not not so much on, like, of course, we're in a business level. I, I think I can I can say that I aspire to be that, but um, the person he is as well is a really big thing for me because um, being able to juggle everything that you do and still be that high-quality person, um, I think it's a really hard thing to balance. Like you said, you might be working 20-hour days and you can still – sit down and be fully present with someone in a conversation and actually have a bit of compassion for what their issues might be. And and uh, people might say that's just being a boss, but I think it goes a little bit deeper than that because people do care. Um, big mentors for me as well as obviously my dad, huge inspiration. Um, and then I know that another big one, uh, well, it would, ha it would have to just be my family really. Um, I think it goes without saying, obviously the people – in the positions that I want to be in. Um, our, our high performing sales agents in our office are a massive inspiration. It's like Atlas, Ben, Darren, Mel, all, all of those people are just next level and um, really taking a good look at what they're doing and, and how they've gone to where they're going. Uh, how they've gone to where they are is, is a big thing for me and sort of being able to sit down and have those conversations. And uh, another huge thing is them not being scared to share that knowledge as well. Um, I think a huge thing in this industry is people want to keep their edge and they think that by someone else succeeding, it takes away from their own success. 
Um, that's very much not the case in our agency. Everyone's very supportive and they, they all want to see each other succeed, which I think is a, a really admirable thing. And um, I'd say inspiration-wise, it's a lot of it comes from my family right now because a lot of my aspirations and goals of where I want to be, um, especially recently when I've done a lot of reflection, is not so money-based anymore. Um, I think that as long as I set up the set up the pathway and the clean cut way of how I'm going to get there, and I've got a good understanding of that, um, it doesn't have to be the be all and end all of everything. You got to start branching out to what else is important because something else that I think of is like what happens when you get there. Like you hear so many people getting rich, getting everything they want, being famous, whatever else, and then they're just depressed because they got no hustle now. They they got no vision. They gave everything they had to get there. Um, but like for me, it's like, why, why do you even want to be wealthy in the first place? Why do you want to be in that position to begin with? Um, and for me, it's my family. Yeah, I, I want to be able to get back to my family. Um, obviously, I want to I want to sort of live a life that we haven't been able to live. Um, and I think that, yeah, being more appreciative to the fact that um, you need to you need to show a little more love and compassion, be a better person for those people as well. Um, and be the best version of yourself for those people as well is a is a big thing that I'm I'm striving towards. So, um, inspirations wise at the moment is yeah those people. And mentioning like you said, Atlas, um, he himself is only twenty, yeah, and the knowledge level. he has is unreal. And the one thing I um, love that Atlas talks about all the time is having an abundance mindset, mm. like appreciating, having gratitude to what you already have, yeah, like your family. Um, you know, the town you grew up in, all those little things that I, I guess like someone like myself ignored for a long time and didn't appreciate. Um, so people like them are just massive to give you those reminders like, hey, man, like take a step back. Again, like I said, we live in Australia. You know, mm. there's people in these third world countries. Um, for me, going to Bali for the first time, you go there for a holiday, but it's actually, it was more like a trip of realisation of like, yeah. oh, shit, like, you know, these people can't even drink their tap water. There's sewage bloody going down the side of the streets. Like, um, yeah, something that I really took for granted is the country we live in. Yeah. Um, when did you get into real estate? Like, what? how old were you when you actually joined Ray White? Was it Ray White that you joined first or did you join another agency before that? Yeah, so I actually started with Ray White. I, um, yeah, so I took a little bit of a different approach and I didn't realise it was different at the time. Um, but I was working as a teacher's aide out at the uh, the school, so I um I ended up about six months before going to Ray White. Realised that okay, I'd, I'm not really what I want to be. I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to progress into a principal's role. I don't want to do the education scheme. Um, purely based on the fact that it wasn't commission based role, it wasn't sales, um, and I felt like I wasn't reaping my full potential. Um, definitely a great retirement plan, I thought, and something I'll keep in my back pocket. But uh, it was six months in there where I realised that okay. I want to get into a commission-based role. We, we thought about the real estate type, type setup. I had a bit of a discussion with Ando again. Um, he himself was a big real estate investor. He had seven or eight houses. He had a pretty big portfolio. Um, so I got a little bit of insights from him. Um, I realized that, okay, if I can't invest in real estate, let's sell it. Um, so let's go have a look at how I'm going to get into that role, sort of figured out what sort of certificates you need to, as a benchmark, to even get in. Um, and I realized you need to search for real estate practice. So I went out, got my course, paid for it, six months of self-paced learning at home. Um, once that was all done, basically had a look at all the agencies in town, gave all the directors a bit of a call, figured out not just getting anywhere was my focus. Um, it was more so finding what's going to be the best fit for me and what's going to have the best upward potential as well. Um, so I sort of had a look at all the, the market share, sort of what volume of sales is going to be going through each agency and um, where that capacity looks. And another huge thing for me is the training side of things. Who's going to do the best job at training me? Because I'd hate to go into an agency, fresh out of teacher's aid role at 19 and just be given a laptop and say, here, go sell stuff. Um, Because you've got no idea and you're going to sink instead of swim. So um, I realised after a bit of research that Ray White's going to be the best fit. Went in, had a bit of a discussion. Didn't look too promising, but come back can I come back <laughs> I just I just nagged and I got in um and we started in as a uh, a receptionist sort of progressed through to that that letting agent role where you're in a concierge team um you're processing applications and everything like that doing some inspections showing people open homes 
Um, from there, you sort of progress into a role where you're sort of helping manage that space. And then from there, property management, getting a really good grasp on what the legislation is for that side of the, uh, the industry and understanding that we are yeah, limited <laughs> in a lot of aspects and you need to be aware of that when you're relaying it to clients and you're dealing with uh, tenants and stuff. So um, really big just learning curves. And then from there, I progress into my role now, which is business development manager. Um, and predominantly what that does, if, if you're not fully aware, it's basically bringing on new landlords uh, to rent with the agency. Um, and my job is to sell them the property management team service and sort of do a bit of negotiations. And it, it's a bit of a split between a, a salary slash commission sort of base role. Um, but you definitely, definitely pay on your results versus your time. Yeah. Yep. Moving forward, uh, looking at the future, like I said, you want to become a real estate agent. Mm. From there, what timeline do you think you're going to be – As how long do you think you'll be a real estate agent for? Like are you seeing yourself only there for five, ten years or something you want to do for the rest of your life or what have you got in place? Yeah, look, I suppose um, I, I suppose it, it ties back into what I said a little bit earlier about how quickly things can change. So um, what I've started to realise is I used to have these elaborate – 30, 40 year plans and I'm just trying to plan out every second of my life for the rest of it. Um, and things just change. There's things that you can't help, things that you can't predict. Um, so I've changed my approach to more of a six monthly to a two year plan, maybe a five yearly plan. Um, I can say without a doubt, I'll be in real estate over the next five years. Um, ideally within Gladstone for sure. Um, oh, I want to be afraid wide, of course, but I think that with yeah, timelines for that space. So I would love to be a real estate agent within the next 12, 18 months doing the selling side of things. Um, but I suppose working from where I am to that position, you, know, you sort of go into an assistant or an associate position um, where you're working alongside another agent that's doing good volume. And then from there you sort of learn all your skills, build up your network, go out on your own, and then you can start being your own business within a business essentially. Yeah. And then I suppose uh, outside of that it's – it, it's definitely just hunkering down, doing what you do your best in, in your real estate career and that wise. But um, there's a lot of stuff that we're working on in the behind the scenes for the personal life too, yeah. Yep. And I guess what's your daily routine look like at the moment? <laughs> Great question. Because <laughs> like you said, you were going extremely down the pathway of just diet, train, yeah. uh, obviously physical labour and then YouTube. Like I said, what's your daily routine like now? Is there a lot more balance? Mm, yeah. So I suppose um, something that I learned really quickly is that um, I, I've i got a really, and I hate when people say this because I, I don't fully agree, but an addictive personality. Um, I would say I'm more inclined to becoming obsessed with things when I get really passionate. Um, so like for me, the diet side of things, I realised that, okay, instead of counting every little macro and every little calorie – um, and becoming fully encompassed in that that whole world. Let's just, if I want to get bigger, eat more food. I, I have a really good understanding of what macros are in different foods and what calories I'm looking at from just face value. Um, and then obviously with your kilojoules and stuff, you can figure out if you're going to eat out. Um, so you sort of just get a, a better understanding of it and you just eat less or eat more. Um, you're going to put some more muscle on, need some more meat or some protein-based stuff. Um, taking a really simplified approach there to take a bit of stress off me. Um, and then with the training side of things, it's just sort of when you can squeeze it in. Um, <laughs> it, it's really, it, it's really a hit and miss with the, with the career as well. Cause obviously it's something that pay, takes precedence for me. It's a, it's a priority. So, um, if I find myself working through till, till midnight one night, I might miss gym. Um, that's on the preface that tomorrow morning I'm getting up so that I can go, go fill in that session or if I don't do it that morning that next afternoon I'm doing a double session to, to sort of bridge where I've missed. Um, but yeah, I suppose it, especially going into where I have been because over that last two years I've sort of taken everything very breezy and um, like I said, I would have given it all up for a social life. So that's something I still actively started implementing in my own life is just being a kid, just enjoying it all. Um, Realised that I was happier with the hustle, <laughs> which was interesting. Um so sort of bringing it back to that over the last 12 months has been a big focus of mine, but um, like you said, balance with it all. So I think that, yeah, daily routine now, 
I'm realizing I'm I'm not a great early bird because I don't get good sleep. Um, it, it it's pretty broken because I change it up and it, it's always it's always flexing. But um, I try to get up within an hour before work, get all your stuff ready, get on top of your emails before you get in, organize your day, start talking with your associates or your assistants and whatever else, and then once you get your plan locked in, sort of hit the day and just from that eight thirty you just flat stick. Um, and then once you get home, that's sort of where I go in and I start, okay, what did I miss over this last two, three days? Let's go fix that up at the gym. Um, have I done enough cardio this week? All right, we'll do that today. And then from there, come home, start focusing on the relationships a little bit more. Um, I actually have a nice dynamic with my family where I actually live with my siblings. Um, definitely something that we needed to do, I would say 12 months ago uh, with the financial pickle that we were in. But I would say more so now, I think it's just a, a relationship building and and just really still being present in each other's lives because um, that's something that my family's huge on. It's been really close. Like, I don't know what it is. It's just, that's just mum and dad, I suppose. It's just so family orientated and um, maintaining that was a big thing for me. So living together is an easy way to do it. Um, and then more importantly, working together all as one, especially having Alex in the business as well and in the same industry, it's it's just so much potential there just for him to bounce off each other and, and, and to get those ideas across and figure out what ne the next day is going to look like and how it could be better. Yeah. I guess looking at that aspect, um, obviously talking about financials, um, you know, money and all that, but you also see relationships. Like what, what do you determine? How do you determine um, success in your eyes? Like mm. is there a day that you're like, oh, I'm successful or you already see yourself as successful now? I would say what I'm working towards is recognizing that I am already successful. Um, recognizing that you uh, appreciate everything you have. Um, that like I, I love and I don't ever do this, but it's something that I've been doing a lot lately is comparing the last six months, 12 months, 18 months, um, those short timelines where, oh my God, look at the difference, look at the position I'm in um, and look at the person I am now. Um, and making sure that's always a step in the right direction, a big focus for me. So um, to me, that success is because if I had a, had a chat with myself 18 months ago and said, well, what do you want to be in the next two years and would you be happy with it? Exactly where I'm at, I would be stoked with. Um, but where I am now, it's sort of like, what's the next thing? So you're, you're not fully stoked, but coming to that mentality where you do appreciate everything um, is a big thing for me and especially in the personal life. But like, you know, when you got that hustle and that drive, you're always looking for the next the next thing, you're hungry. Um, but I think that, yeah, to me, the success side of things is, uh, and a big driver for me is I want to be able to, to do, do some life-changing stuff for my family. Um, but in saying that, you can do that along the way. And that doesn't have to be in the financial aspect. It can be in, it can be in an emotional aspect, being there constantly for them, um, recognising their successes and, and having that, that, that deep relationship with them is, is successful to me. So um, I would say I'm successful, not because I'm, I'm rich or because I'm in a great position in life. I, I would say I'm successful because I've got a happy, healthy family um, and because the person I was 18 months ago would be really happy with me. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think it, you wouldn't so much say it's a quote, but the one Matthew uh, McConaughey says it, um, you know, wins the, the Oscar or whatever trophy it is uh, for best actor or something. And he goes up there and he says, a lot of people ask me who, who is my hero? Like who, who do I look, to, look up to? And um, he said, the person I look up to is me in 10 years time. Yeah. The person who I'm going to be in 10 years time. And I think when I heard that for the first time, I was I just like. goosebumps, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It, it's so true though. Like um, I do it a lot, a lot of the time now, like, I just think about um, what I'm doing now and what I think that's going to eventually evolve into in 10 years' time and look into that person. And um, I guess sometimes you can even look – because a lot of time we're always looking for like listen, trying to listen to the podcast, get that get that one thing that's going to change it all. But a lot of time we already know what we need to do. Um, what We we already know that one thing that's going to change everything. Um, and I found out myself just talking to other people um, – like I don't think at all that I'm successful, know what I'm doing to any regard, regard yet. But a lot of people do ask and ask me some questions and a lot of time we do, yeah, already know what 
is need to be done mm. um, in order to get the job done. So it's great that you have that mindset, um, realizing that you 18 months ago would be proud of the person you are today mm. and something that I think a lot of people should try to attain that abundance mindset, um, being grateful. You may be only 20, like I said, you're already successful in your mind. And a lot of people, like I said myself, find it hard, you know, giving advice to other people because um, in your mind you're like, I know nothing yet. But to me, I see you as someone that has all this knowledge and understanding already. For someone that may even be like 15 or 14 who might be in that, see what people are doing around them, you know, in the McDonald's drinking, already going partying. They don't want to go down that path. They want to follow a path that you've done yourself. What advice would you give them, do you think? Do everything. You just you, I firmly believe that for you to to fully understand something and to have an appreciation for things um, and to learn great lessons, you need to experience it yourself. Um, I love failing at things. It doesn't feel good in the moment. It really sucks and you sort of kick yourself a little bit, but I love the lesson that you get after it um, because there's nothing better than than having that realisation on your own and not having to hear it from someone else and, and doubting it for whatever reason that you do. Um, I think that try everything. For me, I did everything. And that's the advice that I got from from people that were owning businesses and teachers that had done uh, it, real estate investments and everything else. I just got advice from people that are in positions that I wanted to be in. Um, and I just started implementing. And if you, if you think you want to do something and you think, yeah, you could succeed somewhere, just try it. Because the, the thing that I love is that in the age and the time frame that we're in, I can, I can start and reset 10, 20 times from now. Um, and it's not going to have that big of a difference on my life. Like ideally, yes, I would love to get it right first go get it all happen and I'll be better for it in the end. But um, if I don't go try everything and I settle for something that's lesser than what I think I'm worth or I am think I'm capable of, um, I think that regret is the, the bigger thing that, that gets you. And um, uh, I just think that once you've tried it all, you can sort of go, yeah, this is what I liked. This is what I appreciated. This is what I really didn't like. I learned some great lessons from that. Um, I, I think that's the best way to go about it personally. Uh, understandably, I'm 20, so I'm still uh, I'm still on it all on my own. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. For for me, a lot of that happened when I was uh, I was 15 through to 17. Um, I don't know why I said that in that part, time frame so quick and why I just wanted to get it started all so fast. But um, yeah, you're gonna get burnt. It happens. You're gonna fail. Um, but it's just how you pick yourself back up is the big thing there. And if you think it's gonna work, yeah. You just need to keep doing it until it does and just don't give up. So, oh, brother, I um, appreciate your time. What beautiful podcast. Um, as I said, I know you for some time now and I'm always hearing your old boy tell me what you're doing and you're always doing something. And, um, you know, personally, you've probably even been motivated to me, like seeing someone um, around my age, you know, giving it a crack and um, getting out there and from the Glaston region, like, same thing in my mindset. I thought that people from Gladstone couldn't be successful or eventually rich one day. So to see someone like yourself, it gave me that courage to like, you know, do what I'm doing now. So thank you for Definitely. being you, brother. And um, <laughs> thank you, Lockie. Thanks for having me, mate. No worries. Appreciate coming on. Hundred percent. Best for the best for the future, brother. You too.